Hey, today we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject, and that's licensing and SQL Server. Now, there are some things that have changed you may or may not know, but they relate to high availability HA and disaster recovery, DR. So I wanted to go through a few slides of a PowerPoint to explain those things. You may or may not know these things, but they might help you uh, as you think about your HADR options. The following video is made possible by Ryobi Cordless Power Tools. I'm just kidding, they don't sponsor me at all, but I love these things, just got them recently from Home Depot. Made a bargain with my wife that I'd do some projects around the house as long as I got to buy some power tools, and I'm just thrilled about these. So, no idea why I just mentioned that, but let's get going and talk about SQL Server licensing for HA and DR. Okay, here we go. So I don't tend to be a SQL licensing expert at all. I'm just reading from two guides. There is a four page data sheet that's available and I'll give you links to both of these. There's also a 42 page SQL 19 licensing guide. And typically, even though it's 19 and you might have 17 or 12 or something older, typically if you're on a enterprise agreement, these things, you know, or backward compatible, so to speak. So we are referring to the SQL 2019 guide. Let's define a few terms. Sorry if you know this already, you can skip ahead in the video, but just want to even uh, playing field here. HA, high availability, that's I need it right now. If your application is well written, even if the database goes down, the high availability replica comes up a few seconds later and then the, the application is going to retry. So users should not notice or notice very little like oh we got an error then i try it again then it's fine so high availability you have a hot standby typically in the same data center so it's it's really quick we're talking uh seconds dr or disaster recovery on the other hand that's more the um not seconds but it's more like minutes or hours or even in some situations uh days and i'll explain that a little more in in the when we talk about these next two terms, you can't really talk about H and DR without talking about recovery time objective. How long will it take to be ready? So in a disaster recovery, for non-critical, if this isn't your banking app, if it's your BI, you know, business intelligence reporting system, you might be okay with 24 hours until it's back up again. So that's your recovery time objective. How long is it going to take for that system to be ready? And then that begs the question, how much data are you willing to lose? That's RPO, recovery point objective. So let's back up to the DR example. You might be okay waiting 24 hours for your data to be ready, but you don't wanna lose much data. You've got your logs being copied over to another data center every five minutes, a meteorite hits your primary data center. Well, you might lose five minutes worth of data, but you know, five minutes ago, you had a backup, so you're fine there. So that's RTO, RPO. You're always talking about those terms when you're talking about high availability and DR. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, when you talk about licensing, you also have to define what a passive server is. And that's truly a passive server. You're not using this to scale out your reads on your application. Uh, you're not doing reporting off of it. It's truly just sitting there in the case of an emergency. That's a passive server difference between HA and DR, this gets a little bit technical here, but it's in the guide, so I wanted to point it out. High availability replica is defined as a synchronous replica. So in this, if it applies to always on availability groups, which I think this one does, HA you typically have a synchronous replica, meaning you have that hot standby in the same data center. Um, the, the system won't, the database will not continue unless it can commit to both of those. So you have a transaction to your primary uh, database and then your uh, passive replica in a synchronous node, it just wants to make sure it acknowledges that it's gone to both before it carries on. So this is the safest way, but in a DR situation, you don't set it up that way. You set it up asynchronously because there's a big geographic distance between your two data centers. So you don't want to set up DR for synchronous because if something happened to your connection, uh, some little blip in the network, you, you don't want it affecting your primary. So a couple uh, definitions here in the guide. Can't really talk about licensing uh, either without talking about core-based licensing. A few years ago, Microsoft switched from physical processor licensing to physical cores because cores were getting more and more dense within physical processor. So really main thing to point out here is physical processor. If you opened up your 
computer, looked at the motherboard, you would see a physical processor there. You might not know how many cores were in it. You open up that processor and then you can maybe see the cores. Um, so it's all licensed on physical core. You'll also see the term OSE, which is operating system environment in the guide. Uh, here's the definition for that. Um, and then there's also hyper-threading. Sometimes that question comes up a lot. Uh, for hyper-threading on-premises, uh, even though you might have hyper-threading enabled, you don't pay for an extra core license for that. So just know that everything's gone from physical processor to physical core licensing. And then when you get up in the cloud, you start talking about virtual cores. All right, so here we get to the meat of the presentation. Um, for all, all three servers in this slide are on-premises, as indicated by these little buildings. You have your active um, uh, set of VMs here. Um, and you do not pay for your secondary one. That's always been the case, but you also get a passive secondary for DR2. So you can be replicating via log shipping, transactional replication, always on availability groups. You've got two complete backups uh, really standing by ready to go of your primary database, but you're only paying for the first one. You got 12 active cores here. This one here for your passive secondary for HA, you have 12 cores, you're not paying for that and your DR1 either. So 36 total cores in action, you're only paying for the first 12. Now in the Azure Cloud, you have an option of your active server being on premises. Once again, SA uh, means uh, software assurance. That's part of your uh, enterprise agreement. Uh, so you have to make sure you have uh, software assurance, but you can have your passive in the cloud. This wasn't always the case, but now you, let's say you don't have your own DR setup. You've got your primary on, on premises, but you want to set up a DR, but you don't want to set up your entire uh, duplicate data center. So you do that in Azure. So once again, in that situation, you got 12 active cores, you're pushing the data up into Azure for your DR backup, and uh, you do not pay licensing wise. Of course, you're gonna pay for the compute, but you're not gonna pay for the licenses of those other 12. So 24 cores happening here, only paying license for 12 of them. Now here is where it gets, I think, pretty darn cool. So in this scenario, you've got three on-prem and one cloud. You've got your server one, which is your primary, serving all your uh, uh, traffic to your application uh, for the database. You got your hot HA backup, do not pay for that. Then you have a passive secondary for DR. Let's say you do have a DR. So first two servers here on the West Coast of the United States or, or Europe. And then you have uh, a, a disaster recovery data center in another region. And then you can put a DR copy of that in Azure without paying for those licenses. So once again, down here, this is really um, uh, where it all comes together, where you have 48 total cores, but license wise, you're only paying for 12. So this is the thing I can't remember. Last year they introduced uh, this change to the licensing guide. So I really wanted to point that out in other clouds. Yes, you can have a secondary in uh, the, uh, another cloud other than Azure, but you don't have the luxury of uh, a DR1 in addition. So you get you get the one. So that's what the guide points out here. Um, of course, if you do have it set up, like for a, I was on availability uh, group cluster, if you're using, <clears throat> excuse me, that other server for active workloads, then you do pay for it. So just I you know, talked about that earlier in the presentation, but definitely if you're using that for, to scale out your reads, which is a great use case of always on availability group replicas, because you can have eight replicas um, or even more with distributed availability groups. But if you're using that for scaling out your reads or reporting, then of course you need to pay for those licensing. A couple other things to think about. If you set up your cluster, you pay for the highest number of CPUs. So what am I talking about there? For a passive instance of SQL Server to be processed, properly licensed, it cannot require more cores. So you can't have 16 cores in your primary and then your passive is like 24 or 36 or, you know, some multiple of that. 
uh, 32. Um, so just keep that in mind that you, you pay license wise for that, the highest number uh, in that setup. Virtualization, this is getting a little technical here, but I just thought it was worth pointing to, as you know, in Azure with Enterprise Edition and you have a dedicated host, you can license that and then you can do uh, a, a lot of virtualization on top of that, but there is some limit. You, it needs to be equal to the number of core licenses assigned to the server. So for example, if you uh, license this physical uh, dedicated server for uh, with 16 cores, uh, then you can go up to 16 VMs that are part of that. So another thing I thought I'd point out in the guide here, which may be helpful. So. Let's move on to probably, I think the last topic here is Azure hybrid benefits. This is pretty interesting. Um, uh, is if you're thinking of migrating your application to the cloud. So it gives you two main things. Number one, you can, li those licensed cores of SQL Server you already own on premises, you can also put in Azure and use them simultaneously in both locations for 180 days. Then at the end of the 180 days, let's say that's a migration test period, you just you know cut cut off on prem. Those are no longer production. Shut those down, and you just um, uh, it covers the cores in the cloud. So you have 180 days of use of these SQL licenses in both environments. That applies to not just infrastructure as a service, but also platform as a service. So what I, I mean by that. Instead of just a lift and shift VM in Azure, putting your SQL on a VM in Azure, you could also take advantage of uh, Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Database Managed Instance, those platform as a service uh, offerings, um, which give, you know, all of a sudden, obviously, as you know about platform as a service, it takes away a lot of the, um, uh, you know, nitty gritty uh, monitoring management DBA duties of the database, because that's a lot of that is done for you including automatic backups, even auto index creation, et cetera, patching, keeping, you know, it's evergreen version. You don't have to upgrade the uh, SQL to the latest version. That's all handled for you. So Azure hybrid benefit, a uh, good thing to think about. So in this last slide here, just kind of shows an example of that. You could have on-prem uh, SQL server here and then use something like, uh, uh, I, like I mentioned, Azure uh, SQL database. Uh, business critical or general purpose or SQL on a VM. So that's kind of the gist of it. Just wanted to point that out. I think there's some neat new things that you may not have been aware of. Thanks for watching. That's it. Thank you very much.